And now it's indeed a pleasure of mine to welcome our speaker this morning, who is like a big brother to me. <laughs> He's an author, he is a lecturer, and he is a minister who is always reasoning out things into great series of thought and clear rational thinking. Please help me to welcome Reverend Michael Record this morning. Thank you very much, Vance. The way that you described the way that I talk sounds very much like the way you do it. I don't know if it's a characteristic of KC boys, but it, it could be. It could be. Good morning, friends. A wonderful, peaceful, joyful August morning to you who are here in the sanctuary at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in beautiful Jamaica. It's a glorious morning. And the same to you listening to me online from elsewhere in this wide, wonderful world. This church was started some 40 years ago, ago by, by, by Reverend Elmer Lumsden, whose advice to platform speakers was, I quote, always give your audience something to think about. Leave them with something to chew on. I hope this talk, How to Cope with Adversity, will give you that something. The specific adversity I have in mind is the coronavirus pandemic. But you really can use the information on any adversity. Essentially, I'll be telling you how various ordinary people have coped with adversity and how specially, especially wise, knowledgeable people advise us to cope. People like Jesus. Into every life, some rain must fall. That's a common saying. Usually, the saying is taken to mean that some adversity will befall us at some time. But is rain adversity? Right now, in this drought, most of us would love to have lots of rain. But some wouldn't. Those who live in flood-prone areas and those wanting to go to the beach for a nice sunny day. So to some, rain is welcome. To others, it's not. So we see that it depends on your situation and your perception of the event or fact, not on the event or fact itself, which may be true for every incident or circumstance, even the current pandemic. Am I saying that some people are benefiting from the pandemic? Yes. I hear that the big technological, technology companies have gotten richer because so many people are working from home on their computers. Many are like my wife, who bought a new one to work with at home, though we already have four computers, all working well. And the JPS, the Jamaica Public Service, our power company, has benefited too. Our electricity bill has gone up. On the other hand, our gas consumption has gone down as we are driving less. So the lesson for us is obviously, find out how we can benefit from a bad quotes unquote situation, and it won't be bad anymore. For example, I like washing dishes and the pots and the pans and the knives and spoons that we put in the sink after dinner. You probably don't. And really, I don't know anyone else who does. But I like it because while enjoying my splashing about in the water, I get to change a messy situation and transform an area 
in the most important room in the house, the only place you can cook, from ugly and cluttered to sparklingly clean and tidy. I was useful, and I like to be useful. <laughs> I challenge you to find another must-be-changed situation that you can fix in such a short amount of time with a little water. Since no one else likes washing dishes, I'm reminded that I'm different from everybody else. Unique. Do you know what makes you unique? Because you are, you know. Rejoice in it. No two people being alike is proof of God's infinite creativity. Joan Borisenko, PhD, wrote a book, The Power of the Mind to Heal, in which there's a chapter on reframing as a way to deal with adversity. I did some refraining just now when I invited you to look in a fresh way at washing up dishes. In her book, Dr. Borisenko gives three instances of reframing and showing the technique working in diff three different ways. Choose the one most suited for your situation. Story one, a frequent traveler was enjoying life in his new home near Chicago's O'Hare Airport until a runway was built so close to the house that when the planes were coming in, they flew directly over the building and he was able to see the passengers' faces in the windows. It was that close. He found the noise unbearable. And he tried to sell it, but in vain. Then he got an idea. On the roof of the house, he painted in large capital letters, Welcome to Cleveland. This is an air Chicago. Now, when a plane flies overhead, as he thinks about the consternation of the passengers reading the sign, he bursts out laughing. No more stress. Laughter and stress are quite incompatible. He loves his house again. Story two. A little girl became depressed because of her freckles. Her face was full of them. She refused to go to school, and staying at home made her more and more depressed. Her mother took her to Milton Erickson, a noted healer and hypnotist. As soon as he saw her, he put his hands on his hips and bellowed, You are a thief! I know you are a thief! Utterly switching the girl's mind from her freckles, which is what she had come to talk about, to wondering what he was talking about. Erickson then proceeded to tell her an elaborate story of how he saw her sneak into her kitchen, put a ladder up against the cupboard, and steal cookies from the cookie jar. When she realized that he was joking, she felt great rel relief and started laughing. At that moment, Erickson dropped the punchline. The jar of cookies, he said, he saw had fallen down, knocked down a bottle of cinnamon. The cinnamon splashed on her face and gave her the freckles. From that moment, her freckles became associated with the delight and relief she had felt at the story, and she no longer had a problem with her freckles. She went back to school happy. Story three. Dr. Borisenko's husband, Myron, also a psychologist, got a bad case of a cold or the flu 
working in the lab at Harvard University one day. He was so stuffy and achy, he felt he couldn't continue to work. He had a choice of going to the doctor or to a well-known healer who had been getting better results with the six students than the doctors themselves. So he went to the healer's house. He found the healer whom he had never met to be an amiable black man who, from his bed while watching television, immediately started kidding, kidding Myron about his good looks, calling him, oh, a movie star, getting his mind off his ailment. He then gave Myron a large bottle of smelly purple liquid and told him to pour it into the bath water in the bath down the hall and sit in it for exactly 11 minutes. Myron did as he was told. Then, when drying off, he found that the purple color wouldn't come off. He started <laughs> laughing at the thought of what drone his wife would say when she saw that he was purple from the waist down. <laughs> and then what his colleagues at the university would say when they saw the new purple half man. He went back to the healer and was pronounced cured. And he was. All his symptoms had disappeared. Dr. Borisenko ends the story saying that the cure had been effected by simply turning her husband from, and I quote, a groaning pessimist into a laughing optimist. Some of you will have heard a similar story of Norman Cousins, who cured himself of terminal cancer by shutting himself off in a hotel room for months with a pile of comic movies and laughing his illness completely away. You all know that laughter releases healing endorphins and serotonin and the like into the bloodstream. You know, I think that medical training should include entertaining people. Doctors and nurses should get a course or two in clowning, in telling jokes, in generally entertaining people. I think it would just transform our health system. In 1969, psychologist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross came up with a model of the stages of grief that one goes, presumably, when one's loved one dies. It was much quoted for quite a while before it became much criticized for not being based on hard empirical evidence. But on the face of it, it makes sense. And later in a book published after Kubler-Ross's death by co-author David Kessler, he expanded on the 1969 model to include any form of personal loss, such as the loss of a job or the loss of income or major rejection of whatever kind, the end of a relationship, for example, disease, addiction, and so on. And then just this year, 2020, during the current coronavirus pandemic, Kessler applied the five stages of grief originally thought up by Kubler-Ross to our responses to the virus. He says, and I quote, and you will hear the different um, stages of grief. I quote him, there is denial, one stage, which we saw early on. The virus, people kept saying, won't affect us. Then there is anger. Example, you're making me stay home and taking away my activities, people say angrily. Then there's a third stage, bargaining. Okay, 
if I social distance for two weeks, everything will be better, bargaining. Then there is sadness. I don't know when this will end. And finally, there's acceptance. This is happening. I have to figure out how to proceed from here on. Those are the stages of grief originally. Acceptance, as you may well imagine, is where the power lies. We find control in acceptance. You say, I can wash my hands and I can keep safe distance. You have accepted it. I can learn how to live, work virtually. But Kessler, the co-author, also proposed finding meaning as a sixth stage. And this stage I particularly like because if adversity can lead you to finding your life purpose, you would probably cease looking at the event as an adversity and call it an opportunity. Suddenly, it would become something welcome. Most of us know that it is a wonderful moment when we find an answer to the questions, what am I here for on earth? What is it all about? When we find an answer, there is enlightenment, there is insight, there is relief. A weight has dropped off our shoulders. For many reasons, the current pandemic is in fact causing many people to ask those questions about meaning, about their, their purpose in this life. After all, the pandemic, the pandemic is, a is a life and death sort of, sort of event. event. That's one, That's one reason. reason. Worldwide, Worldwide deaths are nearing 800,000. Another reason. It is affecting every country in the world. These things make you ask these questions about the meaning and purpose of your life. Then it started in a city most of the world had never heard of. You can simply get the, the coronavirus, COVID-19, by doing things that you've been doing all your life, like going to the market or the cinema or to church. You can get it from your spouse or your child. You can give it to your grandmother simply by breathing close to her. And at this time, another reason that makes you ask questions about your purpose, about meaning in life, at this time, there is no pill that you can take to prevent it. If those questions don't ask you, don't make you ask these existential questions, what would I do with the rest of my life, for example? Probably nothing will. But they have been making a lot of people ask these questions. So in that sense, the pandemic is having some good effect. Dr. Vic Stricher has a very popular online course on Coursera called Finding Purpose and Meaning in Your Life. Here are some of the questions he says will lead you toward purpose and meaning. And I can guarantee that these questions are good ones, for I have seen them make a big difference in the outlook of inmates in our prisons, in courses taught by our pastor and his assistant pastor in a course called Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life. Here are Dr. Stretcher's questions. I invite you to ask them of yourself. What matters most to you? Who relies on you? Who inspires you? What causes do you care about? What are you grateful for? What gets you out of bed in the morning? How do you want to be remembered when you pass on? 
from this plane? Those questions, when you get your answers, will make a guarantee a major difference in your outlook. And Dr. Stretcher suggests some bonus follow-up questions after you have answered the first set. Which questions did you find easiest to answer? Which questions took you long to answer? Or perhaps, which questions did you choose not to answer? Were there any common answers or themes in your responses? If so, what were they? And then he has a follow-up section in his course. This, the theme of this section being, who am I? And in this, quest, in this section, he asks you to ask of yourself these questions. How would you describe yourself when you are at your best? What two adjectives would you use to describe yourself at this time? When was the last time that you were at your best? Think about these things. And finally, how would others describe you at your best? And some of the adjectives that he suggests you consider, you can come up with your own, but these are some of his. Courageous, healthy, funny, organized, eco-friendly, loving, connected, active, empathetic. Any, any of these resonate with you? I hope so. Engaged, hardworking, community-minded. Does that fit you? Caring, are you balanced, supportive? Are you generous? Are you creative? Are you patient? Are you growing? Are you optimistic? Among others, you can think of your own. I hope some of those described you. Now we move on to one of Jesus' really insightful parables on adversity. Since the topic, adversity, is something that is going to be part of our life. Remember, into every life some rain will fall. It is not surprising that Jesus speaks about adversity quite a bit. One of his most famous parables on the topic is the prodigal son found in St. Luke chapter 15. The main characters in the parable are a wealthy man and his two sons. The wealthy man represents the infinitely abundant universe, and the two sons represent two aspects of humanity. You'll find out who they, what aspects in a little while. The parable begins with the younger son asking his father to give his portion of the family estate to him, the younger son. As the universe always says yes to our demands, and as God has given us free will to do what we want, obviously the Father, who represents the universe, God, does as his son asks. The young man goes off to, I quote, a far country with his wealth. That phrase, far country, hints that something challenging, maybe something even negative, is about to happen. You see, home equals safety and certainty. So logically, far country is the opposite. 
he goes off into a far country, leaving home. But something challenging does not necessarily mean something negative. The young man still has choice. Look what happens to Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or Mark Cuban. They all dropped out of their educational institutions and they went to their equivalent of far countries to do something else. They took risks. Their risks, we know, paid off. Let's see what the younger son does in that far country. He wastes his wealth in riotous living. He wastes his father God given substance. So obviously, no good can come from that. So we are not surprised that he soon finds himself in need. The thing he should do, of course, is to get a job. But that is not what he does. He hires himself out to a farmer. That's how the Bible puts it. He hires himself out. He gives up his most precious gift from God, his freedom. And the consequence is not surprising. He is sent to do the lowest form of work, to tend to pigs, an unclean animal to the Jews of the time. He's there working for a while and actually, I quote, starving to death according to the new international version of the Bible. That shows how far away he has gone from his father. Metaphysically, his heavenly father, the source of life. He's now starving to death. But then the story goes, he came to himself. That's an interesting phrase. He came to himself, his true self. He remembered who he was, the son of a generous, loving father. But there is still guilt. He knew he had done wrong. And so, still thinking on this lower plane of thoughts, the human plane, not the spiritual one, he's thinking he needs to be punished. So he goes back home, you know the story, and he asks to be punished. He asks his father to make him a hired servant. As he had been a hired servant for the pig farmer. And he explains why to his father. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Of course, the father will have none of that. He knows better. He knows the truth about his son. So he ordered his servants to dress the boy nicely with ring and robe and new sandals and to prepare a feast. His beloved son who was dead is alive again, he says. His son who was lost has been found. And so the younger son's story ends. But let's see what is happening with the other important character in the story, the elder son. We find that he's returning home after a hard day's work in the field, and he hears sounds of celebration. He calls a servant, doesn't go in, notice that. Calls a servant and says, what's going on? He's angry when he hears that there's a party in progress to welcome home his younger brother. And he refuses to go in. What is his emotion? Jealousy, anger, resentment, all three perhaps. 
But certainly he too is thinking on a human level, not his highest level, his God level. So his father, God is always reaching out to us. His father comes out to him. That's how the Bible puts it. And pleads with his son to come home. What does this indicate? The boy was as much away from his home in his own distant country, his own far country, as his brother. His words confirm this when he says to his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. And that's a direct quote from the New English Version. This is amazing and disturbing to his father. That is not how he has been regarding the relationship all these years. His response is, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. The elder son didn't know that. I wonder if you'll agree with me that of the two sons, this older one has the more unhealthy, misguided, unloving relationship with their father. Listen again to the words he speaks to. Listen again to the words they speak to their father. And these are the only words we, we are, that are quoted in the Bible. The younger son, in a penitent mood, says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Unquote. Those are his words. And the older son, angry, resentful, says, All these years I've been slaving for you, you and never disobeyed your own order. Yet you never, never gave me a young, a young old goal, so I, so I could celebrate with my friends. But when, but when this son, son of yours, yours notice the content, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him, unquote. Those are the direct words. Their personalities, their, as we call it in sense of mind, their consciousnesses come out in their words. Both have a wrong idea of their true relationship with their father. And more importantly, with themselves. The younger one is not, as he thinks, a worthless human being, as he had come to believe for a while. The older one is not slaving for his father. He's working for himself. That's what the father points out to him. But their actions and their words show that the younger son is more a lover of life. Remember what he did squandered and riotous living. Agreed, not good, but at least he loved life. <coughs> His 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 <coughs> Excuse me. His His brother is a complainer. Who would you rather have a drink with? I, I say the, the younger person, the younger son. I'm sure details of his riotous living in that far country would be entertaining. Frankly, I'm not interested in hearing <coughs> how the older brother slaved for his father all those years and never enjoyed <coughs> a nice veal steak. Both sons needed to learn two things. One, that they are important human beings 
and their relationship with their father should be based on love. One of the enduring questions of life. Thank you. <clears throat> One of the enduring questions of life is why do good people suffer? It is probably <coughs> most often asked in times of adversity, personal and national. One variation of that question, why do good people suffer, is why do bad things happen to innocent babies and children? As most people think that children are, in general, good. <clears throat> Not everybody thinks this way of children. Because some, referring to Psalm 51, think that we are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. That's a paraphrase of the commonly misunderstood verse. You see, one person conceived as a result of a quote-unquote sinful encounter. Let us say rape, for example. I'm, I'm not talking about the Bible story. But let us say that you, you are conceived as a result of rape. That does not mean that the person was born sinful or that all people are sinful, which is how the passage is often misinterpreted. Those people asking the question believe in God, especially those who believe in a just God, their reasoning is that if God is just, bad things ha shouldn't happen to good people. A just God would distribute the rewards and punishments appropriately among humanity. That is to say, those who are good would be re rewarded, and those who are bad would be punished with bad things. It seems a logical argument. But when you look around, in fact, you see that there are good people suffering. The argument is that God, being almighty, could stop that. So why doesn't he or she? The author of the book of Job wrote the story not to answer the probably unanswerable questions, why do bad things happen to good people, but simply to disprove the common belief prevalent up to today in some quarters, that suffering is the result of some wrongdoing, either by you or by your forefathers. But Job, we are shown in the story, Job does not suffer because he sinned. And further, when he's deprived of wealth and family, he still does not turn against God. Job's suffering begins when Satan has, let's call it a bet with God, that he can make Job turn against God by depriving him of things and people that he cares about. So with God's permission, Satan has raiders steal Job's belongings and slaughter his servants. Then fire from the sky burns up his sheep, and a storm destroys his house and kills his sons and daughters. Then Satan causes Job to come down with a horrible <coughs> painful disease. Job remains faithful to God, and Satan loses the bet. <coughs> Job's famous philosophical prayer is, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. <coughs> the Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed 
be the name of the Lord. In closing, I ask you to join me in this affirmative prayer by George Ruffin, published 18 years ago in a Creative Thought magazine. I came across it just yesterday, just in time for this talk. You notice that often happens? It's God's way of showing us that he's always giving us support. You're trying to do something and you get support from unexpected places. God showing us he's always around. I hope this affirmative prayer gives you a little extra to chew on, as Dr. Lums then puts it. Please notice that the treatment only obliquely refers to adversity. And for the most part, it turns directly away from the adversity and focuses on the good that the author wants. And that is precisely how Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of religious science and of science of mind, says we should cope, says we should pray. Here is George Ruffin's affirmative prayer. Please join me. God is all there is, and God is all I need to know. This is my power. This is my awareness. This is my life. I am in God, and God is in me. God is as close to me as the very breath I take. Therefore, I am the allness of God, made manifest right here, right now. I am the power of my word at this instant, and I am mine's strength and creativity. I have strong ideas. They are good ideas, right for the now. Each morning I awake knowing that the intelligence in me is unlimited, and I am centered in it. I am a powerhouse for mind to take action. Right where I am, power surrounds me revealing to me everything I need to know. In this uniqueness of this moment, I feel, act, walk, and talk as the power of God. I am power in expression. <clears throat> My purpose is to be the intention of the infinite, brought to form as my individual being, I am not disturbed by circumstance because I am rooted in divine power. This is God's power expressing through me as me. And so it is. Namaste.